So we are, I, I guess I, well, I'm going to stand here so you can be awkwardly in front of the camera. <laughs> um, so we are very excited to welcome Dr. Vikas, I can never say it right, I'm sorry, Parekh? Parekh. Parekh, um, to our penultimate seminar of, of the 2021 season. Um, he is professor of medicine here at UM and the associate chief medical officer for UM Health. As such, he guides UM's work on capacity management and readmissions, um, leading an operational analytics team working to optimize patient flow, solving operational challenges throughout the health system as part of the multi-million dollar command center project. He earned his medical degree from Harvard Med School and completed his, his residency training here at UM and has won so many awards that I'm going to not spend our entire time um, reading through them, but I will talk about his Chair's Impact Work, uh, Chair's Impact Award for his work during COVID-19, and he has been inducted into the Medical School's League of Educational Excellence. So we are very excited to have him here talking about anything and everything that he thinks would be of interest to us. And if it's okay with you, we can interrupt with questions as we yes. go. Yeah, so um, super excited to talk with you today. Um, and thanks for having me. It's been a long time since I've uh, lectured in uh, uh, college or grad school. So um, a lot of the content is um, really probably uh, content that I've shared with hospital leaders and health system leaders. So please interrupt me if you're like, that makes no sense to me. It's okay. Um, my goal here is really to kind of share a, a breadth of the work that we do in our team in uh, capacity management and operational uh, improvement. Um, and then to talk a little bit about our future vision of what a command center in the healthcare might look like, because uh, we're in the middle of designing and building one. Um, so I'll dive right in. I'll use the screen, maybe it'll work. There we go. Um, so just a roadmap of what we're going to talk about. Um, first, just some background, you know, why does Michigan Medicine even care about capacity management and um, where have we been on a journey of getting better at what we do? Um, then most of the talk, I'll just spend talking about um, things from our playbook. So what does our team do? How do we think about uh, managing hospital capacity and um, some of the cool things that we've done that hopefully um, will resonate with you? And then lastly, we'll talk about role and vision, what um, a command center might be and our vision for the command center that we're building at Michigan Medicine. So first, um, you know, why do we even care about uh, hospital capacity? Um, no surprise, we're capacity constrained. That's why we care, it's a scarce resource. Um, our hospital at um, University Hospital across the street um, is full all the time. So we operate at about 92% occupancy uh, measured at midnight, um, which might be artificial, and more than 100% occupancy on the weekdays, which means we have all of our beds full and people waiting in the emergency room to come in. Um, if you did some simple math and said, where should we be? We're about 40 to 60 beds short. Um, it's about eight to 10% of our capacity uh, as a deficit right now. Um, and we have nothing new coming online until we finish that new tower, um, which got delayed by COVID, so it won't open until 2025. Um, building new towers is not usually the most cost-effective way of expanding capacity. Um, you see our price tag there, so somewhere around $4 million per bed uh, to build a bed, and it takes five years. So um, we've been working on improving capacity for many years, and despite um, doing what we think is a pretty good job, um, we continue to see growing demand and uh, challenging capacity situations. Um, and we're not dissimilar from many of our academic medical center peers. So this is not a isolated problem for us at U of M, although not all hospitals in the state of Michigan, Michigan operate like this. This is probably more of an issue among uh, tertiary and academic medical centers. So kind of centers that see high complexity care. So what that really means is as a health system, as a hospital system, every year we have to create operational efficiencies or find a way to open up 15 to 20 beds um, just to stay flat. And most of us would say staying flat, so keeping our current occupancy and wait times is actually not our desired state. We would actually like to be less full, have better access, 
um, not operate at such extreme levels. So that's probably an understatement of where we need to do every year. Um, so to do this, we've, we've been on a long journey as a health system. And, um, this is mainly just to say this, this isn't easy work. This takes a long time. Um, there's foundational work that all health systems kind of have to do to um, start on this journey. We started that work uh, about six years ago. Um, a lot of work, we involved some external consultants to help us understand our processes, um, established our metrics. So it might be funny to think that a hospital would not have key metrics that they use to measure performance, but you'd be surprised about um, how that is often not the case. Um, then um, we spent a lot of time trying to um, be able to look ahead. So project what's happening in the future to help us plan. Um, we spend a lot of time on something called um, bed mix, which, which sounds complicated, but the simple way to think of it is um, how you fragment and subdivide all of your capacity, okay? And if uh, you probably know that the more that you fragment your capacity and specialize, the less efficient you'll be overall as a hospital. So we spend a lot of time balancing those things. Um, and then a ton of effort revamping our whole hospital leadership structure and operating structure to create a more effective management structure. And then lastly, we've kind of evolved into the, mo the most recent phase, which includes um, our experience with COVID-19, um, where we've, we've spent a lot of time creating um, more advanced data and analytics. We've uh, created a strategic planning process where we um, understand capacity each year and have an actual plan for how we'll do better. Um, and then um, we created a system level capacity function about a year ago. Um, uh, my role along with several other partners um, to manage this kind of work at the health system level, um, to have a cohesive uh, set of experts who, um, who help us uh, do the work. Um, and then finally in fall of 2022, hopefully, um, if we meet our construction and other deadlines, um, we'll roll out our command center, which will centralize all these efforts in one place. Um, so the, so the next part of the talk, I'm really just gonna share some examples of the work we do. Um, it's the Michigan playbook. Um, when I give this talk to non-Michigan people, I always say, you know, you have a house, you have a playbook. I don't understand it because I'm not really a sports guy, but there's stuff like that. Whatever it was, it worked, right? We beat Ohio State, so that was, that was good. Um, I've been here 20 years and you know, my wife's a lifelong native of, of Michigan and she always, you know, I'm always like, really, is Michigan really good? So I was, she probed me right this year that it's actually a good team. I was super excited by that. Um, but I don't play in that big house. This is our big house, right? Our house system, our hospital. And here um, we've created a playbook. So our playbook is how do we think about capacity and patient flow in an organized way um, how do we explain it to everyone from frontline clinicians to our leaders? Um, we have five pillars and they aren't very complicated, hopefully. Um, so the first pillar is really um, what we say, admit the right patients. So paying focus attention to the patients that actually enter the hospital, trying to avoid hospitalizing people who no longer need to be hospitalized, um, not readmitting patients who have just been hospitalized, but now are coming back. Um, really right care in the right place at the right time. So trying to um, create strategies and uh, things that facilitate that work. Um, the next pillar is really admitting patients to the right place. So um, you may or may not know is that, you know, we obviously have our hospitals here on the Hill, but we have partnerships now with um, two other hospitals. So St. Joe's Ann Arbor, where we, um, essentially lease a 26 bed unit of hospital beds from them where we um, staff it with Michigan medicine physicians and move patients from our emergency department to St. Joe's. Um, and then we um, own 49% of Chelsea Hospital um, over in Chelsea, which is also part of the Trinity system. Um, and as part of that partnership, we try to put patients there. Um, now executing on those strategies, very different strategies. Um, St. Joe's Ann Arbor is three miles away. Uh, Chelsea is a little farther, right? 20, 20 miles away. So how do you get patients from Ann Arbor to Chelsea? 
it's not so easy. So you need some different strategies about how you use those beds and patients over there. And we continue to expand. So we may have new partnerships in the future elsewhere in the state. Um, we do own uh, what we now call U of M uh, West out in Grand Rapids, formerly Metro Hospital. We're not really very well integrated with them yet, even though we own them, but we're starting to think about how would we function as an integrated health system. So that would fall in this pillar. Um, then in the middle is, uh, is really the biggest thing, which is um, reducing length of stay. So um, if patients stay in a bed for fewer days, then you will be more effective with how you use your capacity. You can get more patients through your health system, through fixed capacity, if you manage length of stay. Now that you know, sounds easy, but it's not so easy. Um, when you're talking about patients with complex conditions, all kinds of things coming from all over the state. Um, but we have a lot of things we do to try to work in that. Um, then we have uh, what we call encourage efficient use of existing capacity. So this is a lot of work that hopefully will resonate with you. This is where we apply uh, you know, good data and analytics, predictive tools, and a lot of process improvement work to try to improve how we move patients through the capacity that we have, how we get patients from one step to the next step, how we get them from the ER to a bed, um, you name it. Um, and then lastly, managing controllable variations. So all systems and organizations have variability. Healthcare is not an exception. There's a lot of variation in terms of um, when patients come into the hospital, how we schedule patients for their surgery, how long patients stay for the same condition. So all kinds of variability that add up to opportunity if you can manage the variation, reduce the variation, and ideally reduce the absolute value of that length of stay or number of patients coming each day, you'll be more effective and efficient with what you do. So we spend a lot of time in that space. Um, and then the playbook has lots of plays and um, there's a lot of stuff on here, but just to say that Every year we think about uh, what our opportunities are, what are our needs. We use data to kind of drive decision-making. Um, and then we pick the areas that are kind of our strategic focus each year. Um, and the ones I bolded here are just the ones I'm gonna share some examples about. They may not be this year's work, but they're just some examples that I think will hopefully um, help you understand what we do in our group. So um, admitting the right patients. So um, this one's a one that uh, has a lot of attention, but, it, but I'll say is, is one of the more challenging ones out there. What we spend a lot of time doing is saying, you know, patients who come to the emergency room don't always have an emergent life-threatening condition. Um, many patients who come to the emergency room and ultimately get admitted to the hospital potentially um, could have not been cared for in the hospital. Um, if you had identified an alternative way to get them that care, um, and if you intervened before the ER physician who is, um, you know, really kind of thinks in a very set way, makes a decision to admit a patient. And usually a patient in the hospital, uh, in the ED, will be there for four to six hours, and then um, the ED physician will have made a decision to do something, right? Um, so if we were to get ahead of this uh, process, we thought two things were important. One is we have to create all those alternative pathways for patients so they don't have to get admitted. And I won't spend a lot of time there. There's like a lot of technical ease, but one example is um, the ability to see a subspecialist in 24 hours, okay? So sometimes people come to the ED because they have a condition that's acute but not life-threatening. Um, and they get admitted often because what they really need is to see a subspecialist, get some expert advice and get a treatment plan. Um, and sometimes it's easier to do by getting you in the hospital than um, trying to get an appointment in our health system. So we tried to create pathways to get it in ahead of that. The other thing we realized is we need to intervene early in a patient's ED course. So one thing we did is um, create an algorithm that basically tries to predict the likelihood that you'll actually be admitted um, within one hour of you showing up in the ED. So within one hour of you showing up in the ED, we have a ton of information on you. So surprisingly, um, extensive uh, number of elements of data that's captured both from that visit and from your past history. And um, my team who uh, really does awesome work in the space um, using kind of a gradient boosting tree model created an algorithm that really will 
predict with pretty good likelihood, area of curve of 85%, whether or not you'll be admitted within one hour of showing up in the ED. And you might say, that's kind of cool, and why is that important? So what that does is drive what you see up on the screen, which is um, a tool that our case managers in the ED use. So we have a nurse who's called a case manager in the ED. Their role is to try to get ahead of patients who might otherwise uh, be admitted who didn't need to be admitted, might not need to be readmitted, those kind of things, or help patients get home uh, from the ED. And so they work this list, they see patients pop on the list, um, likely to admit, um, they see some other key information and then can connect with the patient, the clinician and say, could this patient be served in a way um, that avoids them coming into the hospital? So one way we kind of use data, operational uh, understanding of what happens in healthcare um, to try to drive an alternative outcome. Um, has been pretty helpful. Usually um, every month, 60 or 70 patients in the ED who we think otherwise would have gotten admitted um, are avoided an admission through the work that we drive through this. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but it's about two beds that we free up every day through that work. Uh, and you remember, a bed costs $4 million to build, right? So that's not a small amount of benefit. All right. So the other pillar I said was admitting patients to the right place. This is really kind of using our partnerships in the right way. Um, so our team also just does fun data stuff. So sometimes the stuff we do is not necessarily um, complex analytics, but it's uh, using data, figuring out how that data informs strategy. So um, this is just a geo map. Each dot is a patient in our health system who fits the profile of a patient who could have gone to either St. Joe's Ann Arbor or Chelsea, just based on the patients that we think we can safely care for there. Um, and you may notice sort of two things if you look at that map. Um, one is there's a lot of blue to the east, right? Um, and you see where um, what we label partner site one, that's St. Joe's Ann Arbor, squarely in the middle of a lot of blue. All right, and then over on the other side, partner site number two, um, not a whole lot of blue out that way, right? Kind of far away from us and not a lot of patients live that way. So what did that drive in terms of strategy? So partner site one is St. Joe's. And I already told you our strategy there is you show up in our ED, we think we can admit you to St. Joe's. We talk to you and say, hey, we can move you over to St. Joe's. We'll pay for your ride, ambulance ride over. You'll be cared by you, by U of M docs. Um, oh, by the way, you get a nice private room um, and it's three miles away. Um, and given all these blue dots, actually, it's not too bad of a strategy. About 50% of patients that we offer that to say yes, go to St. Joe's and uh, under our care and have a great experience. We tried that for Chelsea, partner site two. How do you think that went? Not so great, right? Yeah, when we, just, when we tried that, about 10 to 15% of patients say yes, okay? Very few. Um, geography is one of the biggest barriers for them because um, it can be a 30 minute drive or even longer for them, uh, for the patient, family, et cetera. Yeah. These are, these are emergency department. Uh, before they come in. Nope, these are patients who come into our emergency department and then get admitted, yeah. Yeah, so medical type admissions. Oh, so for, yeah, we, so we had ambulance, yep. We take them in an ambulance to St. Joe's, which is only three miles, but we, we pay for the ambulance and pick up the tab and get them over there. Same thing for Chelsea. Okay. So how often do we decide that the patient is suitable for other we have some clinical criteria that we had kind of already decided, um, mainly based on the availability of um, specialty consults, diagnostics, tests, et cetera. St. Joe's Ann Arbor has pretty much full suite of things. So a lot more patients are eligible to go there. Chelsea um, has pretty good capabilities, but still is a smaller hospital. So some things couldn't go there. Um, so what this meant for Chelsea is, you know, when we looked at this and said, you know, the strategy that we thought of wasn't going to be successful. We need a different strategy. So to your point, our different strategy was, let's think about different patients, maybe patients who are scheduled for uh, coming into the hospital, i.e. surgical patients, um, 
uh, as one option, and that's been very successful. We built a surgical program out there. And the second was, you know, looking at non-surgical patients who are still scheduled to come into the hospital. So there are patients who come into the hospital for care well in advance and trying to program a whole service or um, sort of program out there as opposed to the strategy of pulling people from the ED. So we use this data to kind of make the you know, organization see that perhaps a different strategy would be more successful for Chelsea than for St. Joe's. And um, the data that we used was helpful and informative to them. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. It's a long trip, um, especially if you don't live anywhere near there and, and don't have a good reason to go. So that strategy, we still offer the strategy and we still have 10 to 15% of patients who will um, agree to go to Chelsea, but it's pretty low volume versus um, St. Joe's, which has been very successful and we've been able to fill that unit. Um, how does that change when you're so first of all, can you explain what the reporting is? Sure. Second of all, yeah. I don't want to be driven by ambulance to Chelsea, but I really don't want to lie in such an emergency. Process. Yep, yeah. So boarding is really um, what we call patients who are waiting in the emergency room for a bed. You've already made a decision they need to be admitted, and you're waiting in the ED. So consider it just someone who's waiting or in wait time in a queue um, trying to get to a bed. Um, and so you know what these two strategies have done for us is one, they functionally give us more beds, right? We're able to leverage capacity in each of those sites um, to expand our bed capacity. And obviously then um, there is a relationship between bed capacity and boarding, um, the likelihood that you will wait, right? And if we have an available bed at one of these sites to the patient, we can really say, you know, if, if you ready to go to St. Joe's, we're ready to take you as soon as your ambulance comes here and you won't have to wait in our ED and you'll get there. Oh, and by the way, they have good free parking too. Next. Yes. Did you have to increase your number of ambulances to be able to do this? Yeah. So, um, you know, we have a we don't own our own ambulances, but Huron Valley Ambulance is the ambulance uh, sort of provider of Washtenaw County. That's kind of a non nonprofit, um, and so um, lots of complications. And we'll get into regulations, but um, we essentially have to foot the bill for the ambulance because we don't want to bill the patient. Um, to be able to do that, we have to. Um, go through a bunch of hoops regulatory wise to make sure we're not um, influencing the patient. So we have to kind of put a lot of things around our uh, care there that make sure we're not unduly influencing patient by giving them a free ambulance ride. Not that anyone would hopefully be unduly influenced by that, but um, there's a lot of things we have to go through. But basically we put the bill and um, yeah, we had to create a system where here in Valley Ambulance knew that they would respond in a certain time. Um, recognizing these aren't emergencies though, right? We don't want to pull them away from 911 calls. Right. So the next pillar, um, reduce length of stay. And this one um, is obviously one where we spend a lot of our effort. And two things that our team does. One is we bring sort of expertise about how do you think about patients based on their um, profile, right? So this picture here is just divides up our patients into um, a rough complexity map. So how complex is the patient as defined by a somewhat arbitrary um, metric called case mix index, but um, many people believe it tracks the complexity. It also tracks the how much uh, reimbursement you get. Um, the size of the box is the percent of beds taken up by each of the complexity buckets. So right away, you see that about a third of our patients are kind of on this low complexity or this orange bucket, which is observation. Consider that you know super low complexity patients. Um, and then about a third are in each of the other buckets of medium and high complexity. Um, and then, you know, we won't get into details, but the strategies that you use to reduce length of stay in each of these patients vary. So some patients, like the ones in the orange bucket, are here for 24 to 48 hours. So, you know, their opportunity to reduce length of stay, one, is probably much smaller. Um, but what drives it is often our own processes. So you're often coming in for an example, if you come in for chest pain and we want to make sure you didn't have a heart attack, you're going to get a bunch of tests, okay? So what drives how long you stay often is how long it takes us to get to each test. So one strategy in those patients might be to improve our testing turnaround time. We've also created dedicated units. So those are very high flow um, patient populations. So we've created dedicated units that they just see patients who are kind of short stay, high flow. 
creating operational efficiencies. Then up at the top, this high complexity bucket, um, where about a third of our days are, but only about 15% of our patients. So these are patients who stay a really long time. Um, very different strategies, right? These are super complex patients, probably came from far away, um, often aren't going straight to home. So what do we work on there? We work on things like, where are you going next after the hospital? How do we create better partnerships um, and identify those constraints so we can get you to a nursing home or um, a rehab facility, et cetera, quicker? Um, a lot of these patients were transferred here. So one thing we've kind of figured out is, can we transfer you back to your home hospital once you're better, um, but still need to be in the hospital, but don't need to be at U of M. Um, and then there's a lot of medical and social complexity, what we call outliers. So a lot of patients here who are on the tail of distribution for length of stay, right? So um, those outliers have very unique uh, challenges and um, you need a whole different strategy. And we have a whole team that actually deals with those patients and tries to understand what's keeping them here. How can we facilitate a better addition? So understanding the structure drives kind of the work we do uh, to improve length of stay. Um, another thing we do is just kind of let's understand our data and see what our data might say in terms of the story. So the graph you see here is the length, of, average length of stay of a patient um, adjusted for you know, some of the nuances of complexity, et cetera, um, based on the day you go home, okay? And what, what's striking about that graph? It's sort of interesting. It's, you know, Sunday. If you go home on a Sunday, you have the shortest length of stay. You go home on a Monday, you have the longest length of stay. Do you think we send all the complex patients home on Mondays and all the simple patients home on Sundays? No, not really, right? So what does this point to? This points to the fact that our hospital doesn't really operate the same seven days a week, right? So even though we care for patients seven days a week, we have different staffing, different testing availability, all kinds of stuff different on the weekends. And so if you go home on a Monday, odds are you accumulated delays based on the weekend itself, right? So that points you to a different solution. How do I figure out what services to provide on the weekend to try to reduce length of stay and improve those things? We spent a lot of work doing that. Um, this data just help people see it in a different way and understand that there is an opportunity there. The second thing I show you is a table, um, which is basically saying patients who are in an intensive care unit, when you are ready to move out of an intensive care unit, but we didn't have a bed for you, we call you a hold, okay? And, if, and the number of days you held, one, two, three, four. So how many days you stayed in the ICU when you really needed to go to a general floor? Um, but we didn't have a bed availability. The next column is um, the increase in observed to expected length of stay. So observed to expected length of stay is just a ratio looking at your actual length of stay and that what, what we have expected based on a formula that uses a lot of data to say a typical patient like you would have stayed this many days. Um, if we do our job right, it's at least one, right? The observed to expected is one, or even maybe less than one if you're really efficient. Um, this just says every day you held in an ICU, your observed to expected length of stay went up by 0.1, okay? 10% higher length of stay. So, you know, you might ask why might that be? Why does getting stuck in an ICU when you're ready to go to a floor bed mean you're gonna stay longer? Well, it could be that the ICU is focusing on all the sick patients and maybe they're not paying attention to they're somewhat well patient. Could be that ICUs actually aren't very good at getting people ready for discharge, moving them along their journey, right? And you're there in an ICU getting closer to being able to be discharged, but you're stuck in an ICU or you don't have the right environment. So it's actually probably both of those things. And um, you know, we put a lot of attention on identifying these holes and trying to move them down if we can to general care. But when we can't, we've also tried to make sure that our ICU teams and support services can support these patients, do simple things like walk get up, move around, things that will hopefully get them moving along. So again, data driving decisions that help us do the right thing. All right, we'll transition a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Did you mention the like, benchmark? But one more clear to me, like, How do we do where, where did you guys got? Yeah, so there's a lot of 
places that you can benchmark. Um, we benchmark through um, something that used to be called University Health Collaborative, now called Vizient. Um, don't ask me what Vizient means. It's just what they branded themselves. But basically, it's a consortium of about 200 academic medical centers that all have agreed to share data. Um, the, the, the sort of entity itself, Vizient, which is really a corporation, uh, has a lot of data scientists who work for them. And they come up with a model, basically, based on all that data to create sort of an, both an observed to expected length of stay formula so that among peer institutions, you can kind of compare how you're doing um, and also to kind of give you benchmarking tools. So if you're a member, you can access their database and, and benchmark against other institutions. Yeah. Yes. Um, we have a question from Pat. Um, going back to your previous point, um, can patients show up at partner sites for emergency care and get back to us and do them, or do they have to do the name first and then do it? Yeah, it's a great question. So um, at both hospitals, after we kind of uh, sort of got things moving and, and, and got the kinks out, we now allow patients to go to those EDs as long as they're directed by Michigan Medicine physician um, to get their ED care. Now, their ED care will not be a Michigan Medicine ED doc, but if they need to be admitted, we know about them and we'll admit them to those hospitals. So we didn't do that out of the gate because we didn't really have our systems well organized, but we have done that now. Um, so that allows us to both decompress the ED um, and use those beds effectively. So great question and answer. Um, so moving on to effect, how do we use uh, capacity more effectively? So this is really kind of the day-to-day, -day, how do patients move through our system? Um, how do we get them from the emergency department to a bed or from the OR to a bed? So one thing we've really kind of spent a lot of time is understanding kind of how our system works. So what you see here is what I call kind of a hockey stick curve. So um, the x-axis is how full our hospital is, occupancy, okay? So in the moment when you are um, in the ED and are decided that we need to admit you, how full were we in the moment, okay? Then the y-axis is how long did you wait to get to a bed, boarding time, okay? And what you see is that for a fair amount of occupancy zone, the curve's pretty flat. That um, when we're not super full up to about 90% um, or so, the process time, so how long it takes to get to a bed is relatively flat. But then it starts to inflect in this sort of exponential um, way, okay? Um, and when you look at a graph, you can infer two things. One is intrinsically how efficient is your process? That is that flat part of the curve, right? How long does it take you when you're not capacity constrained to um, get a patient to a bed? And for us, it was about 3.4 hours. Um, a typical academic medical center using some of that benchmark data, about four hours. So we were doing a pretty good job. The second thing is where does that inflection happen? So where does capacity start to impact processes and decision-making of getting you to a bed? Um, and our inflection point is a little bit higher occupancy than other places. So that's pretty good. Um, we're happy with that. We wanted to figure out, you know, how could we make this better? Um, so why does this curve kind of inflect up when we get busier? There's some obvious things, right? So the fuller you are, the likelihood of finding a bed in the moment might be less, right? That seems pretty obvious, okay? What else might influence this? Yeah. Yeah, one, one mistake or one misplacement or the fear of making a mistake, right? So what if I put you in that bed and then the next patient comes in and needs that bed and when am I gonna run out of beds, right? So the decision-making as the resource gets scarcer is more complicated and um, people intrinsically tend to take more time thinking about each of those steps. Um, so a little bit of both of those things. So, um, and then the other thing we talked about before was flexibility, right? So um, these curves are modifiable depending on how big the pool of beds that you're able to put that patient in, right? So if you're a patient and you need an ICU, and I have 10 ICU beds, right? This curve is gonna, get to 90% when I have nine patients in there, right? But let's say I could flexibly use some beds and create 
10 more IC bits, okay? That means that then the curve won't inflect at the same place because I'll have more lower occupancy rate, right? So how we pool capacity could influence the curve on an individual patient basis. And then how do we make those constraint decisions in the moment, right? Or how do we help people make those decisions um, in a better way using data and information science? So we can say, you know, it's okay, put, put uh, patient A in that bed, no worries. We know that over the next two hours, two more beds like that will open up or the likelihood that you'll have another patient that'll need that bed is quite low. So it's okay to go ahead and take that bed and use that. When you're talking about beds, how often are you talking about beds and how often are you talking about or other resources? Yeah. Always one thing or is it, it can be it can be all, all those things go together. When I talk about beds, I kind of mean a staff bed. We'll talk about staffing in a second too, because um, that's obviously a totally separate uh, thing. But um, I mean a bed that has the staff and the right team to take care of you in the moment. So do you think the Ukraine hospital like implement a lot of like off service placement or those beds are just using this money? So what we've what we've done is um, try to create competency to care for patients across multiple units. So um, what traditionally had been called sort of off service placement. So a patient going to a unit that doesn't typically take care of that patient, that's actually not super safe or wise, right? So what we've done instead is said, let's create units that together all can take care of a broader array of patients or can partner with each other to cross the skills when you need them, right? So when that patient shows up on unit 5C, which is next to unit 5B, and 5B knows that patient type really well, 5C doesn't, they can help each other um, support uh, the care of that patient. So that's kind of been our strategy. Right. Getting to Amy's point, and she's not a plan, I think she's seen this talk, staffing is the other thing you have to think about, right? So um, when you have a thousand beds in a hospital, you need to find a nurse to care for every patient in that hospital. Um, you know, and oh, by the way, nursing does their scheduling in a computer system that's totally opaque and disconnected to anything else in our hospital. Um, and oh, they really actually never knew how to get good data out of their system um, because it's kind of not a great system that they use. Um, so they couldn't see their staffing. Oh, and they never really had a good sense of what's my census on my unit going to be any given day, any given hour to match their staffing to the need. So what our team did was um, create a nice visual tool that pulls the data out of that nursing system, tells me how many nurses are in each shift, mashes it against um, a data set that we have of census curves on each unit. So on a Friday on the evening shift, this unit will have this many patients. Then we can visually show the nurse leaders on that unit weeks in advance where they'll be short. So if you see a red body, um, that means you're short one body on that shift right now. Um, if you see green bodies, that means you have more people than you need on that shift right now. This allows a nurse manager in advance of setting, finalizing the schedule to kind of ask people to move around. It also then allows us to know when we might have unavoidable gaps. You know, our nurses have um, a lot of time off. There's only so much you can do. We have a pool of nurses that we keep in kind of a central pool that we use to fill in those gaps. This provides the visibility to say, okay, here's where I need to um, put the patient, pull nurses and when I'll need them so we can understand the gaps. So our goal is to never close a bed because we don't have staff to take care of a patient, right? Um, and this kind of tool helps us um, anticipate, manage, and uh, do a better job of that. Um, the other thing we like to do is predict activity. So um, what, you know, this is an interesting use case. So the most predictable type of hospital use might be moms giving birth. Okay. Why is it predictable? It's pretty <laughs> clear <laughs> once you're pregnant, the likelihood that you'll deliver. Now it's not that simple, right? Not everyone delivers exactly at uh, nine months. Uh, it's not you know, you might have complications, you might have a lot of other things, but, you know, if you were to go around and look at hospitals today and ask them, how many babies do you think you're gonna have next month? 95% of hospitals would tell you, I have no idea. Probably the same I had last month. Or, you know, May is usually busy, so it'll probably be busier in May, but 
don't really know. And the reason that is, is because they don't have great systems to capture all the mothers in the system who have seen them. And then to know of those moms who've come to me for prenatal care before I was born, how many of them are actually gonna deliver at my hospital, okay? So what we did is take all of our wonderful data, all the moms who've come into our OB clinic, um, look at patterns over many years to say, what are the characteristics of mothers who will deliver at Michigan Medicine? Create a model that allows us to very easily say, you're a mom, you've come to us, you've seen us three times, and you live in Ann Arbor, the likelihood you'll deliver at Michigan Medicine is 99%, okay? So we use it to say, okay, tagging mothers who have seen us to the likelihood that they'll come in. And then we accumulate all that data and say, okay, what does that mean for birthing volume, number of babies born? And then we translate it into the census in our birthing center. So we use this uh, data, um, whoops, too fast there. Um, to understand what was gonna go on with COVID-19, right? So you might have, when COVID wave one, uh, so spring 2020 hit, right? Um, there was a lot of questions about what was going on with COVID and births. So first there was, you know, was there, seemed like there were a lot of uh, premature births. And then there was, well, maybe it doesn't seem like there's as many premature births as we expect. And then the question was, will people choose not to have babies because of COVID-19? Right. And so we could, with the data system we created, we could easily answer that question. So first box, you see kind of what we mapped out and saw as the baby bus. So normal delivery volume, about nine months from the first COVID wave through about um, the end of the lockdown period in Michigan, um, which ended in about uh, end of May, um, was depressed. So people chose not to have babies or during, start a uh, make a decision to start a family during that period of time, first three months of the COVID wave. Then summer, things got better, okay? People made a decision to then actually start to have babies. And that resulted in a baby boom actually in summer of 2021. You see that second box and spike. And then things kind of settled back out. Um, and we can now run this, you know, continually. We can look out six months in advance, understand what's happening. What we did practically with this is we saw that baby boom coming um, as early as you know February, January, 2021. So five to six months in advance. Um, our birthing center maximum capacity is 50 beds, okay? Um, and if you're running a birthing center, what likelihood do you wanna have that a mom shows up and you don't have a room for them? You're willing to take much of a chance? No, right? So you want close to zero chance, right? You wanna almost always guarantee that you'll have a bed. So you can't run a birthing center at 90% or 100% any of those things, right? So that was a problem for us. And so what we did is we saw this coming. We said, we need to find a way to expand birthing center capacity temporarily. So we re kind of configured uh, some units in our children's hospital to become expansion birthing center beds. That's not so simple, it takes months of work, right? So that's why we, we saw this coming. We were able to anticipate and do that. Most other hospitals in Michigan didn't see this coming. We're sort of blindsided by their birth surges that everyone experienced. Actually, this was a statewide phenomenon. Um, so we were able to kind of manage through that. And, um, and then we could tell when the surge was over so we could deactivate those beds and change them back to pediatric beds um, to use for the pediatric surge of uh, pediatric hospitalizations that happens fall. All right. So the last thing we do is um, manage variation. And I said, Hospitals have lots of variation. So, um, you know, a few sort of thoughts about variation. There's lots of different types of variation. Um, so there's day of the week variation. So the census in a hospital on a Sunday, is typically the lowest. And when do you think hospital census is the highest? Middle of the week, end of the week. Middle of the week, so Wednesday, Thursday. We'll talk about why that might be so in a second. All right, then every week does not look the same. So hospitals have variability week to week. So we might have really busy weeks, might have quiet weeks. Like so last week, Thanksgiving holiday, kind of quiet actually, even though we were in the middle of a COVID surge, it was still relatively quiet for us. 
relative uh, being the term there, versus this week after the holiday, predictably, COVID or not COVID, it's going to be one of the busiest weeks in the hospital. Okay, Because um, everyone comes back after Thanksgiving and once their care shows up in the ED. Today is usually the busiest night in the ED uh, in the country. So don't go to the ED Monday after Thanksgiving unless you're really sick because you're going to wait a really long time. Then you say, why do we have variation um, in the hospital in these ways? So one thing is the number of patients we admit each day is not the same, okay? A lot of that is our own doing. So um, we don't like to um, operate on weekends. So we do surgery Monday through Friday, okay? Um, that drives some of the variability. The other thing is, you know, no two patients are alike. The bottom graph in the middle is, the length of stay distribution for patients who have one specific disease, um, congestive heart failure. So you see a lot of patients have a pretty short length of stay, kind of in that first orange chunk, but there's a long tail, right? Long tail variation that will drive different levels of occupancy and different outcomes depending on the patient. And then the last graph is saying controllable versus uncontrollable vari variation and things that drive um, census or occupancy in the hospital. So if you were to guess, most of the variation in the hospital's occupancy is driven by emergency room activity and admissions or by scheduled surgery. What would you guess? Emergency room. Okay. Anyone else? There are two options. Anyone going to take the other option? <laughs> scheduled surgery. All right. So it's actually scheduled surgery. So most people would say emergency room, right? Um, before I did this work, I would have said emergency room too, right? Because it, it's emergency, it's unpredictable. You know, to some degree it's unpredictable, but it's predictably unpredictable. Like I said, today is the busiest day in the, the, in the year, right? That's actually predictable year after year after year. Um, the most variability is introduced by scheduled surgery. You might say, why is that the case? Well, I'll say most hospitals schedule surgery based on one resource availability. So what available resource do they use to schedule surgery? Okay. Surgeons or operating rooms? Operating rooms usually. So what they don't think about is beds, okay? So how does the operating room translate to a bed? Not every patient we operate on gets admitted, um, but predictably we'll know which ones do and which ones don't. So that is why we have a lot of variability from scheduled activity. That's also a huge opportunity, right? So if you can manage that variability, you can do a lot to smooth out, level out your load. Um, so two things we've done um, in this space. So one is what we call surgical block optimization. And so I translate that for you. That is um, how we use the operating rooms each day, what type of patient we do on each day, um, a specific focus on the patients that get admitted. So on Monday, what kind of operations will do that get admitted? Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And what we do is we try to think about the patients that are being admitted from surgery, how long will they stay, right? And we try to then use those length of stay patterns to see how things will stack up to create bed need. And so this graph shows you the bed need that is produced out of an operating room um, for a service. Might be cardiac surgery, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so the first graph shows you what it looked like before we did anything, right? So this very sort of, you know, there's not many patients on Sunday, right? Because we didn't operate on Saturday um, or Sunday. So there's not many patients that came from the operating room on Sunday. Monday, we started operating again, but we're just starting to operate, right? And some of those patients that hung out over the weekend, you saw from that length of stay graph, left on Monday. So there's not many on Monday. And then it stacks up to about Thursday where we peak out and then it comes back down as patients get discharged. Right, but that's pretty inefficient, right? That peak is, um, you know, almost 20 beds and the trough is about 10 beds, right? So it's a lot of inefficiency in how you're using your beds. So simple math or complicated math, depending on how you want to do it, probably simple math for most of you guys, um, is to think about those profiles of how long patients stay, optimize the system, and you can optimize it to whatever parameters your surgeons are willing to do, right? They're willing to operate only Monday through Friday, that's fine, you can optimize that. Um, they're not willing to move and operate on specific days. You can put that in the formula in the model. 
whatever the restrictions are, you can still probably come up with a better state than what your prior state was, because the prior state was probably random and not well thought out. And this is what we did. And we were able to trim the top uh, bed use by about three beds, create much more level use. Um, does this work get into the granularity of specific patients' risk for having to stay longer after their surgery? Is it only based on like the nope. surgery? Yep, so we create profiles for patient types based on, so you can get as granular as you want. We use, you know, obviously diagnosis, type of surgery, surgeon. Um, those are the three things that drive the profile. Um, and then we create kind of a profile for that type of patient in a length of stay distribution saying that type of patient, you know, and, and where are they going to be? So like the next day, day one, you get cardiac surgery, 90% of patients are in the ICU, 10% are on the floor. The next day, half and half. The next day, this, and then obviously the number of patients gets smaller as patients get discharged based on the curve. So it's a profile we create for each of those patients, and then we put that into the model um, to then say what's the overall bed use. Um, and you can get really granular, or you could be pretty high level. It really depends on um, the type of patients you're seeing to see how much you need to create an accurate profile. Uh, Scheduling people who might need a longer hospital stay for later in the week so that they can hang out on their own yeah, weekend when yeah. nobody's around. Exactly. But is that a concern that, like, if I need a longer hospital stay for a stop and sit there on a weekend when the staffing is not the same, when the surgery yeah, is a not great question. to come in and do something if something goes wrong? Yeah, so those are both great guys. So you're thinking about it the right way. Yeah, we try to put longer length of stay patients towards the end of the week, take advantage of the weekends. We try to put some of the shorter stay patients um, in the middle of the week so they're in and out before they stack up, right? Um, yeah, and so then you have to think about what would be the unintended consequences of putting all these patients at the end of the week. So then you have to make sure that your weekend staffing is appropriate because I've suddenly changed the census in my ICU, for example, perhaps my cardiac ICU on the weekend. Like if I do this, now there's gonna be a lot more people on a Saturday and Sunday than there were before. So are they staffed appropriately for that? You have to make sure you're thinking through those things. So right on the money. Regardless, we did that and you save a lot of bed days um, and create a lot of opportunity. And by the way, you can operate more on more patients in the same number of beds, right? So that's a great win-win. Um, the other thing we do for surgical variation is then let's look at the big view. So what is the bed use from all of your surgery across a hospital? And this is a visual map, you have to see the details of our university hospital. And so it's really what it's saying is all the patients scheduled for surgery, we've taken all those profiles that I just talked about, length of stay profiles, put them together and then projected how many beds will I use each day? And then we've created a threshold that turns these things different colors. So we've just picked a threshold based on the number of beds we have and our target occupancy. And if you cross that threshold, you turn orange. So those two days, those orange days are oversubscribed, right? So there's a risk that we won't have enough beds on those two days. Now the blue days are undersubscribed. So there's plenty of capacity on the blue days. This is real time updates three times a day as the schedule changes um, and is available to schedulers in the moment. So they can go when they schedule, see the visual, and say, what we generally say is schedule in blue, green is perfect, don't do too much in green. Um, they can see the specific bed need and you know, if there's a little room in green, they could adjust it up if they want to. Um, and the orange is risky. So definitely don't do anything that um, impacts those orange days. Um, but also think about the fact that if you put something on the day before an orange day, that patient's gonna stay, it's gonna impact, right? And they can see the impact of the change in real time. <clears throat> so. Before COVID, we used this really to try to optimize the schedule. We knew we had a lot of these blue weeks. Um, and then we had these occasional oranges and we wanted to drive more green. So we said, you know, use this tool to schedule into those blue weeks, use those beds that are underutilized. Um, and oh, by the way, as a surgeon, you can operate more now on those weeks, get more patients through the system and not have to worry about the chance that they might get canceled last minute because we have a bed for you. In COVID, we flipped it around and said, so what we knew in COVID is we have a surge of patients coming in, using up our beds. So we're not gonna have enough beds to operate the way we used to. 
So what we did is we dialed down the threshold that changes these colors, right? Based on our model of where COVID is going to be. And then we dialed down the threshold to allow us to say, okay, this is now our new limit for surgery. We can't oversubscribe. Okay. And then we made periodic adjustments in COVID and every just had a meeting today saying, gosh, COVID is going up again. We need to adjust down the schedule again for next week. So we had a conversation, set a new threshold. So then everyone knows what we can do next week. And through a series of operational controls, nobody's allowed to go over, um, except for you know, if you have rare good reasons that get approval. So we use it the other way to help us manage activity um, during surges, et cetera. All right, so a lot of different things. I'm just gonna pull us together here in the last few minutes. Um, so, you know, what does a command center do? So the command center for us really is the kind of evolution of all that work, trying to bring it all together in one place um, to drive the outcomes that we want for the health system. It's putting the right people together um, in one place, having the right expertise, and then having the right data and analytics that we've just shown you um, all together every day, understanding what's happening in the health system, um, creating a cadence of work that allows us to kind of sustain the occupancy, manage our beds, um, and do all the great things we've talked about. Um, you know, what, what is it, right? So if you think about command centers in other industries like NASA, airlines, et cetera, right? It's a one spot, right? Geographically central spot where you bring leaders and teams together, everyone who's kind of touching that process, right? You have real-time visibility into the data and operations, right? So you can see what's happening, you know, where the planes are, you know, where the space shuttle is. Um, and then really facilitating the collaboration, right? So the people who previously might've been in different offices, different places are right there. Look at the information, can make a decision after talking to each other. So take that principle and translate it to healthcare all the work I've kind of talked about, right, will now live in that command center where we'll bring together all the right people, the bed managers, the person who does nurse staffing, the people who move patients around the hospital, um, people who control the testing schedule and the diagnostic schedule, all together to try to connect the dots, make the right decisions, move patients along. Um, you need the space. You see kind of our diagram of space, all the cool space. You need the data and analytics, right? The right information to drive the right decisions. Um, and you need to make it visible and transparent to everyone so people know what's going on. That's what we're hoping to do. Um, do these things work? So it's a lot of money, right? I mean, it's not cheap to do any of what I just talked about. Um, so far, um, from what we know, it seems to work. So other health systems that have had command centers, and you see some examples here, these are the outcomes they've reported, right? Improving process times, um, reducing uh, length of stay, uh, taking in more transfers because you have more capacity, um, creating effective beds, reducing wait time, uh, saving a lot of money from reducing um, excess days. So seems to work. Um, so seems like a pretty good idea. Um, what does a command center look like? And here's our vision and goal. So we show you some pictures of other command centers in healthcare. Hopkins, um, Humber River, which is in Canada, um, and Yale. Um, you know, we, we want to create kind of the, the preeminent command center in healthcare. We'll engage our teams, leverage our technology, and create kind of this hub of operations and innovation, we hope, to improve patient flow, access, and patient experience. Now, we'll also fold in some safety and quality. So you have a lot of people, a lot of data. You can also watch things that might be impactful for patients while they're uh, progressing in their clinical care. We can know if you're suddenly uh, showing signs that are subtle of you declining and you might need someone to go check on you and pay attention to you um, in a different way that might not be obvious to the frontline team, not because they're not doing their job or, or smart, it's just because they're doing a lot of other things. And sometimes the clues are pretty subtle. We use data and analytics and we have some nice algorithms that help us predict the likelihood of patients to decline and try to get in front of them that way as well. And then we put our team there that um, has the nurses who respond to emergencies in the same place. So they see a patient like that, they can deploy a team member and go and try to get in front of them. So what are we gonna have in our command center? We have these three big functions, flow and capacity. So that's kind of the work I talked to you about. How do we get patients into bed? 
that's that hockey stick curve. How do we improve that curve? What are each of the little processes that are moving a patient from point to point? And some of the short-term prediction that we do day-to-day -day about staffing, bed availability, activity. Now we're gonna work on length of stay. So that's this work we talked about that really is challenging, but important, right? How do we understand where patients are, wherever they're experiencing delays, move them along their care, as well as some of the work we talked about, about using our partners and avoiding admissions. Um, and then lastly, quality and safety, which is um, some of the stuff I just talked about, kind of cutting edge, but using analytics and predictive tools to identify patients before they have an event and try to get in front of that event um, so that event never happens. Um, the cool thing, and the reason I love what I do is um, the work we do draws from the net of experience and expertise in our health system and our university. So um, we draw from all parts of our healthcare system. Um, we tap into data people, analytics people, people who do care coordination, engineering, um, business school, informatics school, you name it, all kinds of stuff to do the work we do, pulling it all together through the web of the command center. Um, lastly, you know, so what do we learn along this journey? Um, we can run a pretty busy hospital. So if you ever studied hospital occupancy, you might've seen a figure thrown out there of how full a hospital should be. What's the, anyone ever seen an occupancy number that you have in your head that someone says that's the ideal fullness of a hospital? So you might've heard 85% if you do go out in the literature, that's what you'll see. Um, drawn from you know data from a long time ago using some queuing models that might've had lots of flaws in them. We can run a hospital about 92% um, and reasonably manage wait times or boarding times. Um, our ED might quibble a little bit with me, but, but we think it's reasonable and safe. Um, what we really needed was structure. So we spent a lot of time creating structure in the hospital um, to act on the data, drive the strategy. Um, we needed the right team, which is over on this side, right? All the different skills in our team that help, help us create the tools and data and analytics. And then the command center pulls it all together in one place, everyone there with the right experts to kind of drive the operational work and hopefully sustain all this work and continue um, our success. Um, so that's all I have. I know it's right on the hour there, so if that's okay. Um, thanks to my team lead, so Jenny Pardo, um, who's one of our um, IT folks, who's phenomenal, school of public health background. Uh, Max Barcolon, who does a lot of our analytics, uh, math, uh, mathematics background, um, and IT computer science, uh, who helped us do a lot of this work. And happy to do any last minute questions, if there are any. The adoption of like e visits or telemedicine affect the inpatient needs? Yeah, um, do, it's a great question. So, does telemedicine impact um, hospital capacity? So, probably not in the way you've experienced it, um, seeing your primary care doc or your dermatologist through an e visit for an outpatient experience. Where hospitals have used telemedicine is to um, do two things. One is to stretch the reach of staff, so um, especially expertise. So let's say I'm a health system and I have a rural hospital 300 miles away from me that has an ICU, but I don't wanna put an ICU doc up there all the time. I'll create a tele-ICU link, right? So that my ICU doc here can provide expertise to a non-ICU doc up there and see all the data, has a robot that can go see the patient, whatever it is, right, to stretch that. Um, the second way telemedicine is being used is to monitor patients outside the hospital who might have previously been in the hospital, right? So I send you home early, give you a connected device, track all your vitals, et cetera, can keep, keep tabs on you and see if you're doing okay. If you're not, I'll call you, reach you, text you, whatever, and figure out what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's because I personally read an article saying that, as, as you just said, that for the hospital capacity management, the gatekeeper seems a really important role to admit the right patients and mm -hmm. to the right place. But it's not some article said that there's a, for example, the adoption of the EVD system or the direct message things to the doctor kind of get rid of those kind of gatekeepers, then kind of increase the frequency of the visits of the patients. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's had that back on the hospital side, maybe on the outpatient sort of clinic side. Yeah, but good question. So 
Thank you, Vikas. Yeah. If you don't mind staying for another minute no, or no, two, if you fine. folks have some yeah. lingering questions, but I also know it's, it's right out time. I know. So it's getting dark. Cold it's out there, so I'm worried about ice. Yes. So travel home safely and thank you again. That was great.